Hello everyone and welcome to another edition of What's on My Desk. Why the drone? I'll explain after the intro. Oh, sh desk with a grand intro of a drone. Let me explain. Uh, what is a synonym for a drone? Helicopter, unmanned aircraft device, and also quadrocopter because they have quad propellers, four propellers, right? Well, I did this because I brought a very special watch and uh, the watch is the Roger Dubuis Quator or as it's nicknamed the quadrocopter. And let me show you why. At a first glance, you're going to tell me, Roman, this is a quadruple tourbillon. Oh my God, but it is not a quadruple tourbillon. What you see are for balance wheels. Uh, 2013 SIHH, Roger Dubuis introduces the Quator. Just to go back in history a little bit, watchmakers have always been fighting with this pesky little thing called gravity, right? Something that no mechanism out there can get away from. We as humans obviously benefit by gravity. If we didn't, we'd all be floating out in the air and probably be wearing those spacesuits right now, which wouldn't be a bad thing today considering the whole corona thing, but that's not what this is about. So they've been battling gravity with doing what? They've been battling gravity and the number one tool in watchmaking to battle gravity was one made by Luis Breguet, right? The tourbillon. I've showed you plenty of tourbillons out here and I've done numerous things. Your regular tourbillons, the double tourbillons, the double axis tourbillons, the triple axis tourbillons, all for one purpose or one purpose only to negate the effect that gravity has on the watch movement, therefore making it more accurate. Let's first talk about the price tag of this watch. These were limited editions. Uh, in titanium, they made 188 of these. They also made it in precious metals such as white gold, but they also made one very special, I should say three very special pieces. It was a limited run of three where they made the entire case out of silicone, uh, making the price of that watch 1.1 million Swiss francs, where the other pieces came in anywhere from four to 500,000 Swiss francs, depending on the metal. Why did I mention the price of this watch first? Well, one of the reasons the Quattro is so expensive is that it kind of moved away from traditional watch complication, which is the tourbillon, right? This has always been something that was applauded uh, by the manufacturers for the aesthetic beauty. And as I mentioned earlier, the tourbillon mechanism does improve time telling accuracy. And this is what's typically found in the face of a very expensive watch. But instead, Roger Dubuis, along with the designer Gregory Bruton, uh, decided to create four sprung balances for the Quattro, which is what you see on the screen here. One, two, three, Four. Look, the balance wheel is not anything new to watchmaking. It's been around since watchmaking has been around, right? But what Gregory and Roger Dubuis did differently is they have two pairs of these balance wheels. And I'm not 100% sure which ones work in tandem together. I'm assuming it's the top and the bottom ones uh, based on what I see in the back of the movement. But the two pairs working in tandem makes this for an extremely super accurate watch claimed to be more accurate than any other tourbillon out there. So they're set at a 45 degree angle. As I mentioned, the two pairs work in tandem and they're so precise, they can even account for the movement as you're wearing the watch. So it's not just the gravity, it's, you know, if you talk like me and you move your hands around all the time, and I'm sure you guys see me do this, this will take that into consideration. The sound of the watch is super unique because each balance pulses four times a second and they work in pairs rather than get the traditional ticking noise. You get the swirling drone type of noise. It isn't something that you can, you know, hear. If, if you set it down on the desk in a super quiet room, you can actually hear it. But now you see why I did the grand opening with a drone. 590 parts in this watch, 40 hour power reserve. The back of the watch is just as impressive as the front. It's a skeletonized movement, more or less. I say more or less because the middle is not skeletonized. It's a behemoth at 48 millimeters, but it's very light in its titanium version. Obviously, the precious metal versions are very heavy. And again, the $1.1 million one that we made three of, entirely made out of uh, silicone, is extremely light, even lighter than titanium. Let me throw this on my wrist, and I'm going to leave my Submariner on, on purpose, just so you can see the difference in size. Definitely a humongous watch, too big for me, but I would still wear it. You know, guys, I don't care. 
actually sits well on the wrist. Roger W makes a lot of big watches, but they do a good job with the way the lug and the strap system goes together to allow for actual wearability of the watch. It hugs your wrist really, really well, even though you don't, you may not have a large wrist. I'm not gonna talk price on this watch because this watch is actually already sold, uh, but I will tell you one thing, you'd be hard pressed to find any of these. Certainly not the ones they made three of. I've never seen one. I'm fairly certain those that bought it kept it and it's part of their permanent collection because this is a hell of a watch. Last thing I'll add about this watch is that uh, I read somewhere it took 2,400 hours to put this watch together. That's a lot. 2,400 hours, so that's what, 100 days? If you're working 24 hours a day, right? But if you take into consideration that most people work eight hours a day and they have weekends off, it takes a master watchmaker a year to put one of these together. Uh, it's pretty crazy, right? Either case, I'm moving on to other things. And uh, again, there's really no rhyme or reason to this stuff. I brought a Royal Oak with me, a 41 millimeter rose gold chocolate dial Royal Oak. Why did I bring this particular Oak? Well, for two reasons. Number one, let me get this plastic off, hold on. I'll talk to you guys about these new plastic covers. Sometimes they come off easily, sometimes they don't wanna come off at all. Number one reason being, this is my favorite combination in a precious metal Royal Oak, pretty much any size. This happens to be the 41 millimeter size. This is the chocolate with the gold sub dials dial. To me, this is my absolute favorite combination in all precious metal Royal Oaks. Looks great. Why? Because I think it's the best looking one. This is what I like. But the other reason I brought this on is I wanted to do some, somewhat of a comparison, right? So this watch originally retailed for 56.6. Out of the gate, this thing was trading over list. Right now, that price has come down to around retail, slightly under retail. You can pick this watch up. They're still very, very scarce. Uh, you, it's very difficult to find them. But again, some pieces did take a dip due to the fact of what's going on in the world, but not by much. You'd still be hard pressed to find this watch for much under list, right? <clears throat> but Here's another Royal Oak, and this happens to be a Royal Oak Perpetual in yellow gold, right? Uh, one of the things I love about the older Royal Oaks, especially the Perpetuals, is when they show off their movement decorating skills. The movement itself and the rotor on this watch is absolutely amazing looking. Look at that. The rotor is just beautifully, beautifully done and engraved. I like looking at the movements through the back of the watch without having to take them apart. You know, it's, it's, it's eye candy. This watch is eye candy as much from the front as it is from the back. So what's the comparison that I'm doing? I'm gonna ask you guys a question. This is an F serial, which takes this watch back to 2001 to 2007, which brings up an interesting point that I wanted to talk to you guys about. And some of you guys have asked me about this, but I'm currently working with a client, you know who you are, I know you watch my videos, who's looking at a Platinum Royal Oak Perpetual, but a skeleton right? Very rare watch, didn't make very many of them. And he was looking at two options. One was a D serial, which was 1987 to 1994 production. And the other one was an F serial, much like this one. Again, 2001 to 2007. And then he asked me a few questions. And the questions were, how old exactly is this watch? Uh, how many did they exactly make, et cetera, et cetera. You guys, you got some guys out there in the business that will just make up a story. But here's how it works with APs. Unlike Rolex that had you know, there's certain serial letters that will give you a specific year. Sometimes it's over two years, right? Or it overlaps a particular year, right? If, especially when you get into the numbered serial numbers, some of the oldest stuff like five million series versus six million series, et cetera, et cetera. With AP, it's date ranges, right? You know, starting with A series, which is my A serial Royal Oak, 1972, and A series went from 1972 to 1975, on to B series, which was 76 to 79, uh, C series 1980 to 86, and so on and so on and so forth. So when I showed him the two watches, he said, well, how old is this D serial? Is it 1987 or 1994? It's a big gap, right? That's a legitimate question. I said, the only way you can tell how old a particular watch is is by looking at the papers and that can get you closer to the date of manufacture, but it's not necessarily true. Why is it not necessarily true? Because a watch could have been manufactured in 2002, could have sat at the factory for five years until it was sold to an authorized dealer. And an authorized dealer could have had it in the showcase for five years. And then when you finally sold it five years later, he dates the papers, whatever date, and all of a sudden that watch is from that year. It is considering when it comes to warranty of the watch. But that doesn't mean the watch itself couldn't have been manufactured five years prior to that. We, the only thing you can look at is you can look at the range. Now, logically, you can look at the number of the watch. Like this particular perpetual is number 200 and something. Hypothetically, this, is a, this was number 226 watch produced. Of course, we don't know how many were produced, but this tells you this is probably closer to the beginning of the F series. This is more of a 2001, 2002 watch. But what we also don't know is how the numbering system worked. We don't know if this watch was numbered from one to whatever. It could have started at 100. 
So this could have been watch number 100 something because it's two something, right? It's more or less of a scale, right? When you pick up a modern watch, you get a card such as this. Uh, there's a QR code that you can scan and AutoMarpiGay website will pop up with all the information on this particular watch in regards to its warranty, right? With the older stuff, that's not available, so you don't really know. You can kind of sort of gauge. But anyway, we got off topic a little bit. Why did I bring these two watches in here? I wanted to do a side-by-side -side comparison. I told you the price on a Royal Oak. Let's call the newer Royal Oak $55,000. I'm going to put a price on this, selling price on this Royal Oak at around $45,000, just for ease of comparison. Which would you choose? Would you go with what I feel is probably the hottest combination in the Rose Gold Royal Oak, or would you go with something older that's 10 times more complicated because it's now an automatic perpetual calendar at 10,000 less of a price tag? I'm not going to tell you which is my choice. That wouldn't be fair. I don't want to bias anybody's opinion, but I would love for you guys to comment below and say, if I put a gun to your head, regardless whether you can afford this watch or not, let's say if you were in the market to spend anywhere from forty dollars to $60,000 and I gave you these two choices, which watch would you pick? Again, the Perpetual, the slightly older Perpetual, or the brand new hot rose gold Royal Oak. Comment below. I'll look at your comments and I'll discuss it in one of the future videos and I'll tell you which would have been my choice and why. So a little challenge back to you guys. Uh, last but not least, I, there was a Rolex on my desk. It's a, it's a white gold day date. 36 millimeter old school day date, new old stock condition. And you're saying, why Roman all of a sudden you just bring in a plain Jane day date onto the episode? Doesn't seem like there's anything special about this day date until I do this. What is that funky Arabic logo on this watch? This watch was made for the Saudi Arabian cargo airline called SNAS Aviation, I believe. I don't know what SNAS stands for. Something Saudi, other aviation something. The reason I decided to talk to you about these things is that I've always preached the whole thing about watches are not an investment and blah, 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 blah. But some watches are collectibles in the eyes of the collector, right? And I tend to collect both complete watches as well as dials from these watches because they're all interchangeable uh, when it comes to promotional Rolexes, I'll call them, right? Some are promotional, some are made for royalty. I showed you guys the Blue Sky Dweller well, I picked up with the Almani logo in the back, right? The Kanjar logo that was made for the, Pal the Sultan Palace in Oman, right? But there were also a lot of promotional Rolexes out there. Domino's Pizza, Coca-Cola Rolexes. There's so many Rolexes out there that were made, and this is one of those included. A lot of these companies went directly to Rolex and said, look, we want to give this out to some of our employees, some of our pilots, whatever it might be, executives. I need you to make us X amount of Rolexes with our logo on this. And multitude of companies have done that. I haven't seen that done lately. I don't know if Rolex completely stopped doing that, but I'm fairly certain if a big time company like Microsoft reaches out to Rolex and says, look, I need you to make me a thousand pieces with our logo on it that we can give out to our executives as bonuses as whatever it might be, I'm fairly certain Rolex would oblige as they did with the Palace of the Sultan in Oman, as they did with, multitude, with a multitude of Saudi companies other Middle Eastern companies, military watches, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. It has been long known that a lot of watch companies have made contracts with military companies in the past, with, with militaries around the world in the past. And uh, it is no secret that there's a lot of watch companies out there that uh, make contracts with militaries, right, around the world. And, uh, and Rolex is no exception. Getting back to the whole collectibles versus investment thing is, again, watches are not an investment, but they can be collectibles. And there's so many niches out there based on which somebody could collect. For example, these promotional roles is something that sings to me. And not just promotional roles, roles that were made for whether it was a company, an individual, a kingdom, or whatever it might be. And the reason they're appealing to me is because I know they made a lot less of them. This was, this was simply produced for this particular aviation company. How many were they made? I'm not gonna lie to you, I don't know. And if anybody tells you they do know, they don't. Only Rolex knows, and most likely this company knows if they keep that type of a record, right? And then these watches surface out on the market. This one happened to have surfaced out in new old stock condition, as I mentioned. Uh, and this goes back to the argument about that Daytona that everybody was uh, seeing on the antique road shows. Uh, when the, the watch was uh, dubbed to be new old stock, it's because of the sticker that's in the back of the watch, right? That's not worn off. If somebody wore this watch, now it is somewhat worn off. You can still see the number in the back of the watch, but it's not worn off to a point where somebody wears If you wear this watch for a few weeks, that entire sticker will wear off. Now, there's still scratches on the watch, et cetera, et cetera, from handling it because this watch is quite old. 
but this is still what dealers would consider new old stock. Super sharp bezel, watch is working perfectly. This is something that was probably given to somebody that threw in their safe and then some years later they decided to sell it and then might probably changed a few hands among dealers, therefore some of the slate scratches. This is what's most important. Notice there's not a single bend in this bracelet. Had this watch been worn, this bracelet would have been like a rainbow. I've showed you guys this stuff before. Again, not investments, but can be collectibles. And this is just one of the niches that I wanted to show you in which one can collect Rolexes, other brands, and anything else out there for that matter. Usually when collectors collect anything, not even just watches, they look for some kind of a niche, right? I have a collection of old uh, spy cameras sitting over there to my left, right? I happen to like them. Are they worth any money? Not really, they're worth whatever I paid for them because they're appealing to me. This is what I decided to collect, right? Are they an investment? Absolutely not. Could I resell them to a like-minded individual? Yes, and if I made money, um, and if I sold them for more than what I paid, is it an investment? Absolutely not. Uh, it's just a collectible that's appealing to me. I'll show you something else. Uh, I, I mentioned to you guys a bunch of dials, right? So I have a few here that I brought. This is Part of my dial collections. Here's the Domino's one that I mentioned to you, right? Obviously made for Domino's Pizza. Uh, there's a few Arabic dolls in here. I don't remember which one is which. I think this was for the Saudi Army or Air Force, as well as this one. Again, don't quote me on this. I have a few of those Kanjar dials from Oman that I've talked to you guys about. Here's another Domino's Pizza, um, another Kanjar. Uh, this was for some trucking company. Uh, in the United States, I don't remember which one it was. And again, another military dial. I think that's an Air Force dial. Again, I'm not gonna, I don't remember which one is which. I have it written down somewhere. Just to give you an idea of what kind of stuff exists out there. Collect away. So again, if you wanna find something that's special, something that's unique, something that not a whole lot of people are going to have, you can go for promotional type Rolexes. And again, I, I called everything promotional as a blanket. This includes watches made for the military, watches made for companies, watches made for royalty, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And just keep in mind that this is what's appealing to me. It doesn't necessarily have to be appealing to you, but I did this just to show you that if you wanna concentrate on investment, call it collectibles. And by collectibles, I mean something that they made a less off would probably make it more desirable and more pricey. A watch such as this, depending on condition, would trade probably anywhere from low teens for a really, really be old beat up one to high teens up to $20,000. With a dial such as this, you expect, and depending on condition, expect to pay from low 20s to up to $30,000. Again, all depending on the condition of the watch and how complete it is. Well guys, I was going to do an outro for this video, again, with another drone shot. But prior to flying this little guy, which by the way, shout out to DJI. Uh, they made this new little drone that's 249 grams, which makes it illegal to fly anywhere. There's certain places you can't fly drones, but this particular drone you can actually fly anywhere because it's considered to be a toy. It's only 249 grams, but it does kick ass video. But prior to putting this guy up in the air, I pulled out my old Mavic drone, which I haven't used in a while, and apparently there was something wrong with its calibration or compass or something. He crashed into the ceiling. Luckily, I didn't hit anybody downstairs. Oh! So, the second take was with this, and uh, I'm just gonna do my regular outro. By the way, look at this. Look at the size of this thing. That's my phone. That's crazy. That's crazy. So, guys, as always, if you like this video, if you enjoyed what I showed you, hit the like button. If you're not a subscriber to my channel and you are watching this, do me a favor, hit that subscribe button. And last but not least, and this is what helps my channel grow the most, that's why I ask you for this in every single video, share my video among your social media. This is what helps my channel grow organically the most. Other than that, I'll see you guys next Tuesday for more watch reviews and other videos. Did you get that? Oh my God. <laughs> okay. I'm gonna call Ivy to bring the other drone. <laughs>